All right, and we're live. Well, I mean, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Lund Live on Facebook, and I hope everybody's good and healthy. Uh, my name is Chris Hockley, and uh, just a real quick introduction. I've been a Lund Pro Staffer for about, I don't know, 12 years. Uh, started out in Pro V years ago and got a chance to run it and uh, multiple different ones since. And uh, I now work as a uh, the product manager um, at Rapala Canada. And I have the awesome uh, um, job of actually being on the global product development team. So I get a chance to travel around the world and, and design baits and products. And, and uh, you know, one of the guys that gets to use all that stuff is a good friend of mine, Mike Miller, who joins us tonight. And he's the host of Angler Hunter TV. And we're going to be talking about a number of different things, um, early season bass techniques, um, new trends, maybe some photo talk, and, of course, Lund Boats. So do us a favor and uh, tag a buddy, smash that like button, and give us a share and see if we can get this thing going because uh, probably the most entertaining person on the water is Mike Miller, and uh, it'd be fun to just let him go in here. Come on. This is a it's family rated G. <laughs> it's rated G. So fire <laughs> us some comments and uh, let us know where you're from. Ask us your questions, and, uh, yeah, why don't we just get going, Mike? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, it, it's a great time of year. It's spring. Um, like you said, you've been running Lund Boats for over a decade, and I think I'm going on almost 20 years now running Lund Boats, um, all the way back to a Mr. Pike. And I think That's amazing. Uh, Mr. Pike and the, and the original uh, Pro Bass, I think it was at 1800. Do you remember that boat? I've heard tell of that one, but I honestly... Uh... So, yeah, so what, was what, it? What, uh, right? Did you run one of them? Uh, I didn't run one, um, but a guy I fished with had one, and it had a 150 on it, and uh, it was a nice boat. It was an 18 footer, you know, it was it, almost similar layout to the 1875 Pro V Bass. Wow! So, so they're way ahead of their time then. Yeah, yeah, and they they shelved it, and here we are again, and everybody's running them, and there you see the. You see Jeff Gustafson fishing the Bassmasters out of one. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That is. So, you're uh, you're with the Ontario Federation Anglers and Hunters, host of Angler and Hunter TV. Tell us all about that. Yeah, for those for those that don't know me or might not be aware of who I am or where I come from, but uh, I um, was a tournament bass tournament angler from '94 uh, till about 2003 or four. I basically did that for a living, and I got into the TV business, and I was uh, part of the Fishing Canada show for uh, about seven years, up until about 2011, and in 2011, I joined the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and took over producing and hosting the Angler and Hunter, and that's been, uh, we're going on a decade. Incredible how time flies. Yeah, and honest to gosh, Mike, I've got a chance to do uh, and be involved with a lot of television and uh I got to say, you've got to be one of the most entertaining hosts. You have more fun out there and you are really knowledgeable. So that comes through and it's a really entertaining show. I love it. That's good. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's parameters you got to stay within, but. Uh... <laughs> well, it's funny. Like... It's even. even... <laughs> and, have a good time um, there and, and make light of some things, but, you know, fishing is fun, right? So. Yeah, gotta... well. You've uh, you've done a really good job on your you're quite humble when you say you're a tournament guy, but uh, successful tournament guy. Um, you've I'm not sure how many events it is now. I think the last count was 26 tournament wins. And yeah, it's um, been so long since I won a tournament. I don't remember. <laughs> but you know what you're doing for sure. And it's been fun. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it, fishing's an, an interesting game, right? You know, um, I mean, I'm going back to I used to fish. Uh, I fished one year, I fished the Everstart series in the U.S. out of an 1800 Explorer, I believe I had, with a 150 on it. And I don't, GPSs were very, very, you know, minimal. It was a <laughs> little handheld about, I think I have it in my office here somewhere. I could probably dig it up and show you. But it was just a little handheld GPS that I, I mounted on the dash beside my my fish finder, my hummingbird, and that was it. Yeah. So now you can't go fishing without a GPS and, a, and you know, a detailed map. So 
back then, yeah, you know, it's all about re remembering things. Yeah, well, I know I've competed against you for a long time, and uh, it was pretty frustrating. And and the more we, uh, I mean, it was always felt like. I always felt like, you know what, it was kind of like, I, I got to get better. It was always a challenge because you guys would come in. I mean, it wasn't, you, you'd smoke fields. I mean, you know, you guys be 24, 25 pounds and second place was 18. That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, so. uh, you know, and I look at, I look back at some of that, some of the, the, the tournament wins because I, ha I can't reflect on any recent wins. <laughs> you know, but I look back on, on some of those and, you know, some of the best seasons I had, I just sort of snuck through. You know, I, I won a couple tournaments, you know, by like 10 one hundredths of a pound. Um, and some of those big weights that, you know, they, they stick out. But it's the ones that I just eked out that I think I appreciate more, you know, because you had to really work for it. It just didn't, it didn't come easy, I guess, is, is what I'm saying. Well, I mean, we have a mutual friend and your partner of those all those years, and and Mr. Jim Manalakis, and I've talked to him a few times, and he said that dude is just crazy. He's he just he's like I can feel there's a big one here, and yeah. and uh, you'd inevitably pull it out. He said it was just unbelievable. So that's so. What were you doing different? What is it that nothing? You know, I mean, if I, I you know, anytime I've ever had to fish alone or in a pro am situation, I I don't really do that well. You know, I'll bring in two. Two or two five pounders, or a, a six pounder and a seven pounder, and I'll have for fifteen pounds, you know, but not enough to win. But fishing, you know, having a partner in a tournament that is an effective fisherman and, and can mix up his game and put, you know, two pounders in the boat or or three pounders in the boat consistently, well, that takes a lot of pressure off of a guy like me because my mind is fixated only on three or four fish that I find in practice that are big, you know, I might find a fish under a dock or on a stump somewhere or way back in a Creek and I'll focus maybe an hour, hour and a half on catching that fish and then moving on to the next one. And by that, if you get those fish, great. If not, you're euchred, right? So, um, just a, a, having a knack to find big fish is the only thing I can really say gave me success. What yeah. that, yeah. What it is, I don't know. You know, I can just look at an area and say, oh, this is it. It's like, it's sort of like deer hunting or, or you know, hunting. You're, you're looking for something that holds that big buck or whatever. And you put it together and you go and look at those areas and you find it. And if, if you find them and catch them in the tournament, it looks well, like you know, I think you, you hit it right on the head there, though. I, some of the, not even some of, I think the best anglers that I know. And on this planet, and I've had a chance to meet an awful pile of them doing what I've done, and they're all hunters. They, right. they, it's just different. They look at it like hunting, and it's it's just that next level. It's cool. Yeah, it's incredible. It's uh, it, it, you know, there's, I it, it, it mean, it's 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 bred into us from, you know, centuries of survival is hunting and. Um, you know, that's why certain tribes back in the, when the first nations people, they had hunters, they had people that did other jobs, but you know, the hunters were always the get out there and, and get us some food or, or, or find something you see movies about it. Right. So yeah. And from a, from a, from being a little kid, I always wanted to go out in the woods and hunt stuff, you know, whether it was just, just to see it or find out, uh, you know, where it lives or what have you. And it, it relates to fishing. You know, musky fishing, I, I think more so. If you're a musky angler, a lot of good musky anglers know where that, that big fish holds at certain times of the year or certain times of day even, and they'll go and hunt them, you know, a musky hunter. Yeah, they're uh, they're pretty dedicated anglers, and uh, it's pretty fun to watch a real serious musky guy in the boat operate. It's uh, it's the same thing, right? They, they take it real seriously, and, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Hey, Mike. We uh, we just got a question here uh, from Tony Wong. Uh, can you explain the the Nico rig, the Ned rig, the Tokyo rig? What's the best time to use them, or when is best time to use them? And you know, it's kind of funny. Those it's there's a lot in that one question. So yeah. maybe we can tack one at a time. Uh, you know, you were telling me about a story of using the Nico rig out on uh, on Lake Simcoe, and you were targeting big smallies. In fact, I think you might even have done a show on at that point. So you're using it then. 
Yeah, the, I mean, a Nico rig, um, it's it has I, I you know I don't know what it is that makes the fish hit it uh, as opposed to just maybe a wacky rig, right? Um, but a, an eco rig, uh, when that bait falls and the the weight at the one end of it hits bottom, and it it'll just sort of bounce there like that. You know, it, it's almost like a, a slinky. It just drives fish crazy. Now, I I rarely use that unless I'm sight fishing. I, I won't go out and yeah. just cast an eco rig around and fish it's it's far too slow and and methodical to to go out and just fish with it but if you spot a fish um maybe it's cruising a weed line or maybe it's holding off of some sort of piece of structure and oftentimes a fish will chase and turn around and go back to that structure or you'll yeah. throw a bait at it and it won't even look at it or be interested that's when you i'll have a eco rigged set up on the deck, pick it up and throw it in. So an eco rig is a good bait for sight fishing, I find. Yeah, I really like them for sight fishing. I like them for target fishing, like you said. Um, I, I'll often, if, especially if you've seen a, a fish come out on, on a bait, um, say under a dock or, you know, that kind of thing. And you can get an, an eco rig, you can almost get it to bounce right on the spot. And I, I, I mean, if you look at it in the water, that, that bait, we don't unfortunately have one, but if you have your hook that's pointed up this way and you're pulling it halfway, you get that tail that flicks as it bounces off the bottom. I'm convinced it looks like a bait fish that's literally just pecking its way along the bottom. It just and you can work it so tight to, to certain cover of rocks and all those things. That's that's when I use it. Yeah, and I've added I've I've had more success with the the Nico weight with the skirt on it. Uh, you can talk a little. Yeah, bit. yeah, that one. skirt I find is is dynamite. Yeah, I think it's just that little extra something that's going on there. That's uh, that's the VMC weight that goes up inside the yeah. skirted weight, and and uh, yeah, it just adds that little bit of something. And sometimes just contrast, because oftentimes you're doing it when you're like you said, sight fishing. You're in real clear water, and you're wanting to uh, you know course a fish into to grabbing it. So you're real you're using really natural colors, but you can throw just that pop of chartreuse or something in that skirt to really attract them. That's right. Yeah, I mean, Tony asked about you know, Ned rigs, Tokyo rigs, um, Nico rigs. And, and that's the good thing about, you know, especially the tournament with the, with the pro V basses that we run is I have, yeah. I have a rod in that rod locker, 15 rods, but I have a Nico rig. I have a Ned rig. I have all those rigs he's talking about set up in that rod locker. So like just pop the, the lid open and slide it out and use it. But it, it, the best time to use them, is when you can't get fish to bite. That's that's a pretty simple answer, right? Yeah. There's a lot more effective lures to use to, to cover water and, and, and utilize your time. If you use those rigs and try and fish up, you know, you're you're gonna be burning the clock basically is what happens. You're gonna be wasting a lot of time. So if you if you find fish and can't get them to bite, pull out open the rod locker and pull out all of those things. But I'll often use a Ned rig just a little differently than a than a uh, Nico, and uh, I will actually. I, I'm not I'm not purposely trying to cover water with it. But if I have a bigger expansive area that I know there's fish there, but they may be a little fussy, either they're pressured or, you know, it could be a cold front or whatever. I, I mean that that Ned rig is absolutely deadly sometimes. It's unbelievable how you can go right up behind people and catch fish, and they're yeah. like, "What are you throwing?" Yeah, it is effective. I mean, I, I can, you know, a Ned rig is, is a simple rig. I mean, I don't know if, if Tony knows exactly what he says, explain it, but it's just a little mushroom head with a with a small, maybe a one-aught hook, fine hook. And yeah. it, it's half of a stick bait, half of a, a Senko style bait, right? And to tell you the truth, I mean, not, not only for bass, but uh, a few years back up in Lake of the Woods, um, we were practicing for KBI, and a storm brute came in and we got stranded in, at a, in an old camp on an island. We stayed overnight and had no food in the boat. And Scotty Dingwall pulled out a Ned rig, found a school of walleye and some shell rocks and just proceeded to catch like six in a row on a Ned rig. And I was throwing <laughs> a big head with a twister tail thinking I'm walleye fishing. And I never even got a boat. <laughs> Torqued them all on that Ned rig. So it's a, yeah. it's a fun bait. It's very finesse bait and, and fish eat it. And is there a better looking bait, maybe a tube, arguably, but that looks more like a goby? Yeah. So, it, I mean, 
those are those are finesse baits, and and it takes a little bit of practice to rig them. Um, but if you have yeah. fish that you can't get to bite, take those, take them out and use them. I mean, I think I hope that answers the question. Well, and I think we've got one other rig that we haven't talked about there, and and uh, I got to be honest, I kind of cheated tonight because I, it's one I did want to talk about. It's the uh, <laughs> the Tokyo rig. It's, it's almost impossible to explain to somebody unless you've actually seen it. And so I have a couple things here. I got a chance to use it um, just prior to it coming out. It's a VMC. It's another one of our VMC products. Um, but the the versatility of this thing, the more I use it, the more I realize what you can do with it. You know, I mean, initially it looks like a, a small, um, almost a drop shot. But it's when I can a drop shot and a bottom bouncer, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and so I mean I have one here empty that I I, uh, I have right here, and you can see it's got you know you tie your line on, um, on this swivel right here, and then you've got this dangling weight that you can you can put one on, uh, you can put two, you can put them back to back so they you know you end up with uh, um, like a torpedo look, but that's what I found with this thing is you can throw on. Any worm you want, you can Texas rig it. So what I've started using it for is actually punching. I'll put on back-to-back -back weight. So I'll put a couple um, half-ounce weight so you have a total of one. And this thing actually, I mean, it, it, it sits like this. And that weight just punches, and then it pulls your bait, no matter what it is, right down underneath. And once it's down there, it's not like a Texas rig that holds right to the bottom. It actually still it's loose and limber and so you can move your bait around and it's down there doing its magic and I I yeah, love it. You can, yeah, I mean you could probably relate. Um, I the only time I've ever used it is when there's um, a, a moss bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, you see that on, on in the clear lakes. You see like moss growing on stones and, and a tube turns. It's slime. It's almost a slime, and your tube will yeah. get slimy. Or your grub or anything you put down there will get slimy and and using a Tokyo rig, it keeps your bait just out of that slime and yeah. right on top of it. Lake Scugog in, in southern Ontario gets a lot of that mossy growth on the bottom and yeah. your bait disappears into it. But a Tokyo rig um, will keep it above. And if you put a floating plastic uh, trailer on it, even better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it doesn't, I mean, the, the thing that I, I can't stress enough with it is even when you're throwing it and it's flying through the air, it's fluttering, doing all this it does like, look it, it's like after the making, right? <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> exactly. You're but you know, I saw a video. Day. I saw a video that Wired to Fish did, um, and then later talked to Dan Quinn, who is our uh, pro staff guy uh, coordinator for uh, uh, the U.S. And they did a show, um, but the Wired Wired to Fish did a, a thing where they actually put a, a weight on it, and we were talking about the versatility of this thing. They put a swim bait on the back of it. And literally dragged it like you would drag a tube, and it would just pop along, and it was ticking along the bottom, giving this real erratic. But that yeah, swim bait just going. Yeah, rig for walleye, right? Oh yeah, I mean walleye smallies. Yeah. I, I mean, oh my gosh, I, I I got so excited watching the video, I had to jump in the boat and go out and try it, and it's just magical. I, it, like here I am punching with it, then you can use it like a drop shot piece, and then you're dragging for smallies with the exact same rig. It's it's a lot of fun. So that's that's a real good one. And thanks for that question, Tony. So speaking of all these uh, different techniques, we've got uh, our bass season starting up here, and uh, well, I guess next weekend, Mike. So uh, I don't know about you, but I often spend a lot of time thinking about where am I going to be and what's my first cast with what. And what's your, do you think about that? And what's it, what is it going to be for you? You know, it's, I'm, I'm pretty excited about bass season, obviously. Um, it's hard to not just go out and take my flipping stick and start slinging a jig. But yeah. I truly the most exciting thing for me is fishing swim baits, I think. Um, and 13 Fishing's got some new swim baits out. That I'm going to be messing around with and going. I'm going largemouth fishing, and I'm going to be throwing a swim bait, whether I'm in pencil reeds or pads or or around docks. I'm just going to be pounding the shoreline, looking for some hogs. Yeah, absolutely. So, are you? Uh, you know, we're we're obviously going out dry. We we haven't had a chance to to try anything yet. Uh, I mean, I don't. 
uh, go out and do any scouting beforehand. Um, what's your what's your plan? I mean, where are you headed? What, like what uh, what kind of are you heading? Like you, myself, I like shallow stuff this time of year. I like the, I, the I really like the fish. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the fish stuff that I know in even a, less than a month's time is probably going to be dry. Dry, and dry that's where I, or you can't access it because of the weed right. growth. Yeah, one of the two, right? And and those are just magic spots early in the season, whether it's uh, you know shallow bays or little areas where you know they've spawned in the little cuts or rivers or or those kind of things. And uh, I mean, I know I yeah wood. <laughs> Yeah, I know you. <laughs> There's some big ones on the wood. I know you love it. Yeah, wood. There's a guy. I see Jeff Browning. For, he's going to fish Erie on Father's Day. Father's Day's what? The twenty first. That's two weeks away. Yeah, I guess it is. It's. Uh, so, uh, how much experience do you have on Lake Erie? I've had a chance to fish Erie quite a few times. Um, I've had some. Uh, really experienced anglers i get to spend a, enough time out there to know that it's it's just magical i mean i don't know of another lake where you can catch as many fish as uh, uh, smallies in particular as yeah, you can on here right i mean it's like four pounder after four pounder after four pounder and and uh, I, i've had the chance to fish it with some really knowledgeable people so it's kind of short track to success and i i don't know i i love fishing erie and i love the fish there and i mean uh, the numbers are unbelievable. Yeah, and my, you know, he's in Erie, obviously, on the south side. Um, my experience has been, you know, a lot of Canadian anglers will go over to the U.S. side of Erie and fish it, you know, pre-spawn and get big bags of fish. But he's going to be out there sort of just first week of sort of that post-spawn period. And there'll probably be a lot of uh, smaller fish on beds. At least yep. late, late spawners, but and uh, you know the only advice I could give them would be to go to the first point, the first drop off, off of a spawning shoal or or or, or an air, a flat where they've spawned, and you know I'm I'm kind of old school with a search bait and a half ounce tandem willow spear bait <laughs> will pretty much find <laughs> any bass in the lake. Might not bite it, but it's going to follow it to the boat and that'll put you on them. So. Um, well, I, uh, I jerk baits, jerk baits too. Yeah, you know, but a five I or mean, you know, you'll find three or four fish schooled up that are up to you know five and six pounds. Those big females, and they're usually hunting in a little small pack together. Uh, yeah, and a search bait, yeah, like a jerk bait, but you know, um, it works good. I've never, I've never fished Erie with top water, I, because I, it's just that deep lake that you don't have that mentality on. But you could probably find some protected areas out there and, and fish top water and find a lot of fish too. Yeah. I find that, uh, I mean, I going back to the jerk bait thing, uh, especially with the, the amount of jerk baits that we have access to through the, you know, through Rapala. But I mean, um, I love throwing them in the spring, especially when you get them on cruising fish because you can fish them shallow and you know yeah. that those fish that are active once they come off those beds are going to actually come up after them too. So you can fish them shallow. You can get a, a, a suspending jerk bait or you can get like a, a shadow wrap where you know you where they slightly rise when you stop them, or you can get it where they slightly drop. And if they're holding on something, whether it's beds or whatever, and you have that bait that dress drops down right on top of their head, I clobbered them. I, that's you just brought up a point. I mean, uh, the storm Arashi spin bait. I did. Oh a, yeah. I did a show with those last year around that same time. It was last week of June, first week of July, and wowzers you just get yeah, and, and then uh, half a it's just crazy. it just flies yeah. and just reel it in real slow and you can jig it you can twitch it drop it lift it i mean a, a spin bait I, I would i would i would suggest that go buy some storm arashi spin baits and, and try them on lake erie because you might be fishing you know eight to twelve feet and then dropping off into you know 15 to 25 feet and that spin bait you can fish all those depths effectively with it so get out there and catch them and the greatest thing about a spin bait is it, it you know you have to fight yourself to not impart any action you throw yeah. it as far as you possibly can 
and then you just reel a slow and when you stop it's got that shimmy as it goes down and it's got the two props going i mean you just slow roll it back and you i mean anybody can catch fish on that yeah. thing and it is deadly so. you cover tons of water with it yeah that's a great call on that one yeah um tony here asked too uh do you have talons on your boat one or two and what size would you recommend so you and i are running the exact same boat i think pretty so. much set yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got the two talons on the back of mine. You have yours. Um, you have 12s? Uh, yeah, typically I have twelves. Um, do you do you go to the fifteens or do you keep with the twelves? I had the fifteens uh, last year, and I I really found I didn't I you know there wasn't many spots with you know twelve to fifteen feet of water that I taloned down in. And yeah. I switched to 12s again this year. I mean, 12, I think 12 is the ideal number. Um, 15s, it depends where you fish, Jeff. Um, um, you know, on, who was it, Tony, that asked that? Yeah, yeah, Tony. It, it, de it depends where you fish, you know, on what size we recommend. Because a, a few years back, um, our home bodies of water here in, in south-central Ontario, like the Kawartha Lake systems, are, are generally shallow lakes. And I actually put eight-foot talons um uh when they first came out on my yeah my first pro v bass because i like to go under bridges and, and get into creeks and backwaters and um i didn't have the tilt brackets and the little eight footers sit lower than the uh, outboard and yeah if you're a largemouth fisherman an eight foot town fantastic if you're a smallmouth fisherman or, or you're a walleye fisherman or you're a musky angler you're going to want to go with the longest talent you can get away with because you know the old adage, if only you had another inch or foot. <laughs> that's right, two foot either. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one that's a good question, too. Uh, I actually did a video on this, and it, it was whether you have one or two. And, I mean, in a perfect world, we see the uh, the pros running around, and, I mean, they've got the, the best technologies, and they have everything available. But if you're on a budget, um, you know, if you don't have the money to spend, I, okay, you know what, I can't get the – the souped up electric motor on the front, the Ultrex or whichever model you sure. prefer. And then you know, two 15 foot talons on the back. I, I don't know about you, Mike, but my choice, if I was to, to do it, I was on a budget. I think what I would do is get one talon on the back and spend the extra money on, on say an Ultrex or Altera or whatever on the front. Because what I find is, you know, if you're in fishing in, in deeper water, you can put that talon down and now the boat will spin on that. But if you put your electric motor on spot lock, that's, it holds you dead. Th that's the next question from from Neil there, and it, it's interesting you said that because I had a pro guide. I had an 18, 1825 pro guide mm -hmm. a couple of years back. I'm trying to, you know, and on on a pro guide tiller, I had one talon, and I would use the mid coda on the front on spot lock, and and like you said, I could swing that boat around on that talon. Um, yeah. And, and and work an area so having one talon you you do have an advantage yeah yeah absolutely i'd agree and so if you were to make the decision uh talons or um you know spot lock uh, uh you know like, again altera altrex whatever it is you're using up front mm. which one would you go for if you could pick one well uh, the problem is i use my talons a lot when i launch my lund just to hold the boat when i pull the trailer off <laughs> 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 I'm using an Ultrex on it, right? But I, I did have a an Altera a couple of years back where I could just launch the boat, hit the button, deploy the trolling motor. So if you have an Altera, you don't need talons. If you have an Ultrex, you need talons. How's that? Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. That's a good answer. <laughs> so we've we've got Christians just asked a question. What shaft length of Ultrex is best all around for 1875 Pro V bass? Some guys say the 52 if you fish small lakes or the 60 inch if you fish the Great Lakes. Um, what's the best lengths all around to do both? I've never run the 60 on the Pro V bass. Have you? Never. No, I've only ever gone with the 52 and it's very rare that I would run into a situation where that head's coming out of the water. And in those days, you shouldn't be out there anyways. <laughs> yeah, you've got plenty. you got plenty of shaft length with the 52. You don't need to go to the 60. I mean, if you're running just a Pro V, I say go 60 uh, because you have that extra bow depth, right? 
Uh, yeah. And on my Pro Vs in the past, I ran 60 inch shaft. Rarely did I need that extra length. But like you said, if it's rolling out there, you're trying to to troll with the with the Minn Kota, you're going to want that 60 inch. But on the Pro V bass, uh, whether it's the 1875 or the 2075, 52 is all you all you need. Well, the other I thing ran, too, I, I ran 45. Was it the 45 inch? Okay. I'm going back now. But I ran a, yeah. I, my original the first year the Pro V 1875 Pro V bass and I had the 45 inch shaft. But okay, I, I was beating up a lot of eggs in rough water. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You know, for me, I, I I don't know if I would suggest a sixty inch because um, I mean I think the question Christian says here is best all around to do both. Uh, we just talked about the situation where it doesn't you know we've never had it come out. But on the flip side, you and I both fish water that's so shallow the belly of the boat's going to be rubbing on the bottom, and I I have to lift my electric up. And it's not a it's not an issue when I have the 52. But if there was a 60 inch, it'd be like having a telephone pole in front of you. So yeah, I hit my rod off it a lot when it was up high at the 60. So yeah, yeah. And now um, Neil's asking us if he has a tie. Do we yep. a 60 or 72 inch? That's a that's a tough one. Um, yeah. I we're gonna assume tie tie aluminum and not tie glass. Um, but I think you know I don't I, the the original um, the, the the sixty well, they just came out with the seventy two recently I believe um, if if I'm not mistaken. But I did a show on Lake Ontario uh, with a guy with a tie and he basically does his whole setup by himself. He trolls. He puts his kicker in gear. Puts his Minn Kota okay. down and steers his boat with his Minn Kota. And he only had a 60 inch on a tie, and it, it worked fantastic. So, um, if you're going to be using that trolling motor in, in real rough Great Lakes size waves, if you're going from a 60 to a 72, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. I think you can get away with a 60. Yeah, yeah. If it's so rough, yeah, I would, coming out, a 60's coming out of the water, you probably shouldn't be out there running your trolling motor. <laughs> well, Jeff asked, yeah, Jeff's asking another question here. He has a 52-inch on a 2075 Pro-V bass. Is there enough room to keep a 360 deep enough in the water? I'm thinking of buying one. i got to be honest, I've not used the 360 myself. Um, I've been in the boat with guys that have. Uh, I, it's something that I definitely would look at doing but uh are you running one mike no uh i ran one previously but i think i had a altera i'm kind of i'm trying to remember the boat i had an altera with it might have been a longer 50 the altera had a different shaft length i i can't answer that question honestly but i, yeah. do, know, yeah. I do know with the with the pro v bass with the 52 inch shaft there's a lot of of that motor in the water when you drop it down to the bottom absolutely uh, so I, I would say i would i would i would guess that yeah you're you're probably okay of mounting the 360 on there because i you know i've seen guys with glass boats and there's not much trolling motor in the water at all and they have 360s on it so yeah, yeah. that's what i was saying if you can do it on the, the limited amount of uh adjustable height on a on a glass you know standard kind of fiberglass bass boat on the front you're gonna have no issue on the one yeah yeah so hopefully that answers that i mean i, I don't want to steer them wrong go tell them to go out and buy one and then find you can't do it but <laughs> from what i've seen and my experience i think he's fine yeah i would think so too so so we got this uh bass season coming up uh we were talking about it a little bit earlier but mike you and i both love throwing frogs I do. and there's always been a amongst frog guys you know what is what's the gear you got to throw what how heavy a braid you know it's always that argument do you go 65 or do you go to 80 and um you know I'm, some guys are using leaders and some guys aren't i mean what's what's your setup when you go frogging i'm caveman style when i go frogging you know <laughs> basically take the winch off the uh, amount of winch on the front of my lund and <laughs> throw that frog as far as i can and winch that frog back into the boat so, you know, anywhere from like a, a 7 4 to a 7 11, heavy action, extra heavy. I don't go extra heavy. I like a heavy action rod because it has a bit of bend. So yeah. 
for slinging that frog. And then 65 pound suffix direct to that frog and count to three and smash them and drag them in. That's yeah. It's I'm the same. I'll go up to a, a seven, nine. Uh, but again, I don't go that extra heavy. I don't like it. I like to have a little bit of flex there, but I, uh, I do the same thing. I use 65 and I'll go to the 80 and I've never, I've, I've tried it. Um, I got a chance to fish with the uh, the Azumis actually, and both Bob and Wayne were using leaders when they were flipping and pitching and all that. Floral, which was really, yeah, because I, I honestly had tried it. Uh, I mean, uh, having seen them doing that, and I thought, okay, well then. But I've, I mean, I've blown up knots, and it, I mean, yeah. I've done all kinds of different knots. It, it just when you're in short length, I'm a big dude. But sixty-five pound braid, seven foot nine, heavy rod, and a and a fish in a short length of line. I mean, I I popped it, so I just don't bother. You know, if you're in heavy cover, I just don't think you need it. Yeah, my like I set the hook hard. I, a lot of guys don't set the hook hard. They do yeah. the pole, but I'm a bit of a lunatic when it comes to setting my hook. So I would I would explode those knots. I've done it. I've tied a leader, or like a twenty pound floral leader, onto sixty-five pound braid, and it doesn't end well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's funny because one of the next things I wanted to talk about with you, Mike, was electronics because I got a chance last year, and this is a question Tony's asking here about uh, side imaging or mega down imaging. Which one would you go with? And I got a chance and started using my electronics last year um, with that side imaging purposely. So I, I, I set up the graph, turn on the mapping. And I'd use my Navionics chips to, it's got those one foot increments. And I know in this lake that I'm fishing, and it could be any lake, but I know eight feet is the magic line where, where uh, weed lines would be. So I would set the depth chart so that it would show that, you know, that depth, eight feet. And then I would turn on my side imaging. And even on lakes that I'd not fished, I could cruise out along those areas and I could shoot far enough out the side that I could actually map and, and point those, um, uh, that those weed lines. And then you can, of course, the for, I was fortunate. I was using side imaging and mega down so I could actually tell the bottom structure even better. And you could see soft from bottom. So when you had a weed line and you had a transition from soft to, to hard, you know, that red to more yellowish, I mean, those are just magic spots. I cannot tell you how many fish I caught, really quickly on lakes that were so big just by narrowing it down that way. And I don't know if you use it the same way. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I'm going to take it by the questions he's asked us. He is a bass fisherman. Um, now I can't personally, I can't go on my boat and fish with outside imaging anymore. Um, yeah. I, I go to so many new bodies of water. I, I, I got to try and learn stuff as fast as I can. And I'm going to say 100% of the time I put that bolt in the water, I'm, I'm clicking over to my side imaging screen and yeah. I'm going to look because I, you need to know what's out there. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're cutting a path this big with your down imaging looking below you, or you're going, you know, 120 feet out this way, you're covering a lot more water. Now fishing for fishing, if, it, if it's strictly for fishing, down imaging works great if he's a deep water fisherman or something, but I would always go with, with the side imaging first. Yeah. Yeah. I use it the same way. It's just, and as I was just saying, narrowing it down. Uh, we were actually doing a photo shoot out on one of our local lakes here. It was dead calm, hot, and we weren't catching anything. And I, you know, I just turned, I said, okay, enough. We turned on the side imaging and started doing cuts back and forth. And I found a school of fish sitting in a depression. There was absolutely nothing there. It was just six inches deeper. And there was a bunch of them. I marked it, you know, way out the side with the, the, the mapping turned the boat around and we caught fish. I mean, I, I was so convinced when that, that kind of thing happens. It's just crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, side imaging, it, it, if you had to decide, it would be, I would, I would say side imaging. Now he also has 360 versus a Garmin. I'm, I'm going to assume he's comparing it to um, like pan optics or something. Yeah, optics. Now, I've, pan optics is, is hard to learn. You have to, you have to teach yourself to, to use it. Um, and it's good for, I think, a more sort of direct application. 360, it, it, it boggles your mind when you actually understand what you're looking at. Um, 360 imaging, you know, you can you can see 
you could pull up if you're musky fishing for instance you could be cast yeah. musky and you know when you go into that fog where you're not paying attention and you stop doing figure eights or, or a j and you pull that bait out of the water and you cast again uh, but 360 imaging have actually watched muskies that followed my bait from that's crazy yeah from the side of the boat turn and go under the boat or turn and go behind the boat so 360 imaging is incredible and, and you know you i've watched some of the guys on bass masters using it and it's 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 almost unfair how how effective it can be yeah you know we we saw that today uh the speaking of bass the bass elite uh just got going again today they're down in the fall and and the weights are incredible and uh, there's been a lot of guys talking on that if you've been watching the live today about how the 360 imaging is helping them and and doing what they need to do to produce fish i mean those those dudes are getting paid for it and they got to produce and they're saying the same thing yeah you know and, and uh, you know we talked earlier before we came live is you know back you know when i made my money and made my this career bass fishing uh i didn't have access to any of this stuff and i had a, a lund that got out of the hole quick and went super shallow and i basically just tore up lakes and covered as much water as i could going into back swamps and, and inaccessible areas and explored right yeah Where now you know we were now i can drive halfway across the country to a lake i've never been to and have it unfold in front of me on a screen and and drive to it and go and check it out so you know it's a, it's yeah. a it's sort of a, a testament to old school fishing where i would go into back bays and stuff like that right where a guy yeah. and a, new guys in glass boats would never go because they would want they never get back on plane because they'd overheat yeah yep like, yep it, and uh, if they had a map to show them what was back there they would want to get there but with you know with those lungs it was always i'm going back there because <laughs> i know you were Half and drive across this two foot swamp, right? So it's amazing that, uh, you know, the advantage I had was fishing out of a lung because I didn't have GPS technology. Now everybody's got it and you could basically fish anywhere you want. You know, that was probably one of my, well, it wasn't probably, it was my biggest hesitation when um, I first joined the Lund Pro staff was again, you and I fish a lot of real shallow stuff. And my first boat was that year was going to be the Pro V. And I thought, how in the world am I going to fish an entire season out of a walleye boat? I thought, well, you know what? They, they're a cool boat. Let me give it a try and I'll see, uh, you know, maybe I got to learn some new techniques. But I found that that thing, exactly what you said, it floats like a cork. I could get into shallower water in that boat. And now the Pro V bass, I'm sure, even shallower. And then, like you said, once you get back there, it doesn't take you half an hour to put your way back out you can get up on play there's no hole shot in those boats if you wait them properly i mean you're just boom up and on, on firing out of those those bays yeah you know i compare it's funny i compare my lungs you know because there's guys out there running glass boats that'll do upwards of 80 miles an hour and mm -hmm. rarely are the conditions nice enough that you can go that fast right yeah. Um, but you know, when I was a kid, I liked hot rods, whether it was a, you know, a Camaro or a Mustang. And I, I compare Lund boats to those because a, a, a quarter mile, nothing is faster than a Lund, right? Especially the Pro V. Uh, yeah. I can get yeah. on plane and out of any swamp, any shallow area and get up to full speed, full trim. Well, I watch guys slugging it, trying to get on plane, um, and, and it's it's probably the the greatest thing that's ever happened personally to me was when Lund came out with the with the Pro V Bass. Yeah, absolutely. Because now you've got the boat the same hole that we were talking about with the Pro V, but now it's got the bass cap on it. And, and Story, I mean, and, walkers, I mean, it's the, the live well system, yeah. the whole boat. It's it's the perfect package. And I see guys at weigh in still. I still fish the odd tournament. And I see guys and they pull up and they're like, man. I yeah. Love. Well. You, so here's a question here that kind of flows into that is Christian's asking what rigs we're running this year, both boats and motor. And, you know, you've always run, uh, we've run the same boat, the uh, either, a, a, well, it's 1875 Pro V Bass with a 200 horsepower uh, Merc on the back of it. Um, you've always run the bench and I've always run the excess seating. So I have the seating for four in mine. Right. 
Yeah, the uh, so I'm, I, I'm I'm strictly a fan of the bench because I've got tournament fishing on the brain, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've only got I, I've only got one kid that's coming fishing with me. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, that's what I like about the excess seating because I can put two people in there, and even. And you know what happens. I have some good buddies that come fishing with me and they can't decide what they're going to bring. So they got 20 rods and they have a, a duffel bag or two or three that weigh another 90, 100 pounds. And, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's so much storage in those boats, but we often just put them right behind their seat and then they have access to it all day long. But on those days when you want to take the family out, you've got lots. And I don't feel like it's a compromise because the back deck is still massive, even with those fold down seats back there. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we've worked at the, at the Toronto International Boat Show and other shows, um, even up in Winnipeg. Uh, it, it is a family friendly bass boat. That's for sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you see, you hear people, you see families coming to look at it. And it's always the deciding factor is we need those extra seats. Um, not only for families, though, but I mean, if you're a guide, if you're a professional guide, whether you're a musky guide or, or a bass guide, uh, that it, those extra seats, I mean, that's money, right? You put two or three more people in the boat and, and you're making money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I know when we do kids events and those kind of things, it's fun. Uh, I, I was doing an event last year and I got a chance to take out uh grandfather and two kids with me and everybody sat comfortably and uh, it, that was a, a good deal but for me i carry a ton of equipment i mean not only am i a, a product guy for a fishing company one of the biggest in the world so i got more tackle and it's unbelievable it's like a floating tackle shop but then i carry just as much camera gear because i do so much photography and i'm telling you i don't know but i still have empty compartments so when people come with me they can put their stuff into because i can't fill it there's so much room in those boats I emptied, I, I emptied my boat out two years ago, um, and I got a full-size Ram pickup, and I ran out of space in the box of that truck to, to put everything that was in my lung. <laughs> it, just, it, was like a, it was like one of those scenes where clowns are coming out of cars. There was rods, <laughs> rain suits, life jackets. I mean, the storage in that boat blew my mind, but, you know, it's an eight, I love the 1875. I love running it with the 200 two talons, uh, uh, you know, the mink coat on the front and propping it, you know, I've experimented over the years, propping it. Um, if you're, if you're going to buy that boat, you're going to want to look at a 19 or a 20 pitch, 20 pitch are hard to find. You're going to get a four blade, a little more expensive, but a 20 pitch probably is ideal for that boat. A 19, um, you get a fantastic hole shot. You give up a little bit of top end. Um, but if you're going to run that boat, don't try and over prop it with a 23 or a, or a, or a 25 because you're just not going to get the RPMs and you're not going to get that blood and hole shot, right? Yeah. What uh, what prop are you putting on yours, Mike? What was that again? Uh, I run a Tempest, Mercury Tempest to 19 this year, and I'm getting I'm running the new Pro XS 200 V8, so I'm getting 5800 RPMs wide open throttle. So I'm still short on RPM. But if you yeah. prop down to get that max RPM, I'm going to lose speed, right? I could probably go to a 24 blade and keep the RPMs the same and gain, uh, you know, a couple miles an hour and, and run high 50s, 58 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's I another 21s and 22s and uh, 20s ideal. So I don't know if that, that answers the question on the setup of the boat. Yeah, I know. I I'm going to have to get on my phone. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, some guy named Ron Linder. You know who that guy is? He's the godfather of fishing, is he not? <laughs> so it's funny that he asked that question, though, and it, it, because hand tillers versus wheel rigs. And, and I mean, joking or not, I've got a good buddy of mine. We've been pricing a pro guide all week for him. He's hellbent. He loves to troll. He loves to uh, do a lot of walleye fishing, and but multi-species stuff and that boat is wide open and has tons of storage for rods. You know, you've got that station right beside you. That pro guide's awesome. I mean, I I can't wait for him to pick it up. It's looking forward to going, so. Yeah, you go down to the Niagara River and there's there's pro guides out there all over the place. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I've, I've had the pleasure of having a few conversations with Ron over the years back a couple decades ago now, but, um, I, I personally, I, I ran an 18, I ran an 18 pro guide Mm, I don't know, three or four, maybe five years ago. I've lost track of time. 
I love yeah. a tiller. What's happened when you old? Yeah, it, it goes right. But I, I love a tiller. Um, it's so it's versatile. Everything, yeah. everything's at your hands at the back there. You control the the deck space is phenomenal. Uh, the only thing you're going to give up is protection from the elements. Whether you're fishing, um, you know, a dual console like a, on the Pro V Bass or the Pro Vs or uh, an IFS with the full windshield. I mean, if you're running across, we had a question earlier about fishing Lake Erie. If you're running across Lake Erie in October, you want that wind yeah. in front of you. So in, yeah. in ideal conditions, um, a, a tiller is a great boat. In fact, it's the ultimate boat. But if you're going to be exposed to, to bad weather conditions and you've got people on board that, you know, maybe are, are, are afraid of the weather or big waves and want to be comfortable, having a windshield in front of you, makes a big difference it sure does yeah in those conditions when it's nasty it's can make all the difference in the world we missed a question there with tony is asking what batteries you use um, i'm not sure if he means brand or if he means the type of battery i mean i still use the traditional um i mean i i've always used excite batteries but i i i don't know if uh lots of people talking about lithiums and, and yeah, i think I'm that's what it, that's what he's probably asking. I mean, I'm running AGMs. AGMs are good batteries. Um, yep. Shouldn't have a problem with an AGM battery. But I I almost bit on lithiums um, at the spring fishing show. I talked to a company that made lithiums, and they weighed like 13 pounds. Like the, the weight difference yeah. was astronomical. Yeah. But, uh, I, I didn't pull the trigger. The price was – they're pretty pricey. And I just don't know enough guys that have – to have experience saying yes they're great or they have their downfall so I, I really do want to try the lithium thing but agms are are, are so reliable yeah and that's the thing for me it's because i can pick them up anywhere you don't have to worry about a special charger you i mean you can grab your buddies if you need it and uh the lithiums like you said are really expensive they do save you the weight but I, i'll be honest i'm not the guy that needs to go 100 miles an hour I, i'm not worried about that I find the boat floats shallow enough that I have no issue getting in any of the water I have. So I've just and, stuck you know, with that. It, it, especially in the Lund. The good thing about a Lund is, like, if I put myself in it and an empty tank of gas and nothing in the live wells, it, it does the same speed as it does full. That's of right. Gas. Live wells full and two or three people in the boat. It gets up <laughs> and goes, right? Um, well, that's not what you did last year when I got into your boat. Well, that was different. I was on a diet since then. <laughs> and that was a 1236 John boat, right? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Imagine you and I in a 12 foot John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Mike, one of the things that we spend a lot of time in our boats, but I, I mean, you know, working with London, always, you know, having the boats, uh, you know, different shows and what have you, I spend an awful lot of time cleaning my boat and I try to keep it immaculate at all times because you're representing the company and I, I appreciate what they do for me and and I, I like to have a nice clean rig but there's a lot of I, I last year and this year again I'm going to have a black boat hard water black boat that heat I mean you bake on that water uh, or the calcium um, and I've got I've got some stuff that I've been using just to keep it real simple I don't know how do you keep that same clean regiment or do you uh not stick so tightly to it. There. Well, you know, <laughs> boat, it, it, the only time my boat's clean is when we're filming for TV. <laughs> Fair <laughs> otherwise, enough. Otherwise, it's a swamp monster, man. I get so much weeds and stuff on that boat. Um, yeah. It, it is tough to keep the boat clean. Um, and if if I was just a, a bass guy and I didn't do what I do for a living, I'd probably have the dirtiest boat in the, on the lake. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not, I'm serious, right? Because I I just yeah. I like fishing. That's why I'm laughing. Man, I don't time to clean my boat. I'm gonna I want to go fishing. So, yeah. unfortunately, I do got to keep it clean. Um, and I'm a big fan of just water and vinegar. Well, that's funny because that's uh, what I've got into. I, I mean, I think I always try to wipe my boat down at the ramp whenever I can. So I always just keep a you know just. I keep a num number, you can buy them so cheap, you just keep a bundle of uh, microfiber towels in your glove box, and I just pull them out and wash them, and you can toss them if you need to, but 
that's what I, I'll wipe it down there. And then when I get home, I just have a little spritzer. I used half distilled water, half vinegar and spritz the boat down, wipe it. And if for whatever reason I've decided to leave it and it's got really bad um, calcium buildup or whatever, I've been, uh, I've been using scrubbing bubbles. Really? You buy the can. Yeah. So you buy scrubbing bubbles, you buy it for three, four bucks at Walmart. And you can do your entire boat. Uh, like I, again, we have the 1875. I'll I'll do four, or five full cleanings with a, just a single can, mm. and it's amazing. You, you spray it on, you let it go from that uh, purple into white, and then just give it a wipe, and it takes that calcium off like nothing I've ever seen. It it and that's it. That's all you need to do. Wipe it down with a, a microfiber towel, and uh, it's just so easy, so quick that. And, and it's nice because it doesn't hurt your cowling. It uh, doesn't hurt the windshields at all. Um, so no issue there at all. And that's uh, so I, I love using that. I need, I need to see firsthand. So we'll, we'll do a we'll do a live. I'll bring my boat to your place there after a week or two of bass fishing on Scugog. <laughs> and you can go over the boat and show me how you do it, all right? <laughs> yeah, we won't record that one. There may be a few choice words. <laughs> But you know, there's a there's a new product. I just saw it. I get the the newsletter. If anybody wants to learn more about, especially the deep inside the industry, there's a, a newsletter called the the Fishing News. It's free. You can sign up for it. It comes uh, daily. And yesterday there was actually a little ad caught my eye just because the amount of time that I spend cleaning the boat. And I do not like cleaning my boat, but you got to do it. Um, it's called Barnacle X. And we ran into a, an issue last year where we kept one of our boats in the water just a little too long in Lake Ontario and came out with all this calcium buildup that I've never seen before. It was so thick. And this Barnacle X is, is from a company called Corrosion Technologies. I have nothing to do with these people or this product, but I'm pretty excited about getting a chance to try it because they're saying it's specifically formulated for removing biologics and hard water without damaging your boat. And it's apparently the first one on the market like this. So originally excited. Oh, <laughs> uh, huh, that's cool. Huh? Well, there for all the boat cleaning fanatics out there, Chris just hooked you up with some great tips and I'm still just going to spray some hot water and vinegar on mine and <laughs> greasy. greasy. <laughs> we, we just uh, a question there from Jeff Browning about skag guards. Yeah. Uh, I've looked at skag guards for as long as I've been a fisherman and never put one on my boat. Um, there are a couple of years where I put the boat away and I said, boy, I wish I had a skag guard. My skag wouldn't look like it does right now. <laughs> but, uh, but for the most part, I've never had issues banging up my skags. So I've, I've yeah, never I've never... I've never done that either. I've never put that on. Uh, I've, I've been pretty lucky, touch wood, that uh, I'm pretty careful with mine. I make sure that I'm not running in crazy places. But those things happen, no matter how careful you are. Yeah. But I, I've never, I, never I, used one myself. No, but I think personally, if I had a skeg guard on my motor, I might be a little more careless. You know, oh, Lord. brave. You know, oh, don't worry if there's rocks in there. We don't know what's going on. Well, so it, it, it's almost a catch twenty two, right? If it's not yeah. clear, you're a little more cautious. If you have a skate guard, you might think, ah, pfft. what's and, a and on the, I, I've seen you, I've seen you run some water that I watch as you coming out. It scares me to death. If you were more, uh, not careless, but reckless with that, that could be a show. We can sell some tickets to that one. <laughs> it's all, it's all professional driving. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, folks. I'm a professional. That's right. Don't try this at home. <laughs> but, uh, so how about crankbaits real quickly sorry how about crankbaits so i got to talk about this oh, i sure. work with rap i know that there's a lot of jerk baits so we are a jerk bait nation but crankbaits are just absolutely astounding to me you throw them out they wobble on their way in you can get shallow like i've been using a lot of square bills uh the, the brat for example is one i had used last year I caught more big fish on that thing. It was unbelievable. And especially this time of year, as you're going out, we said to go in shallow and then we want to move a little bit deeper. You know, they're going to between their beds and where they're going to stay for the summer. And I cover a ton of water with them and catch a ton of fish. And the more people really experienced anglers that I speak to, 
oh yeah, you know, I use them too, but there's a lot of guys still aren't. Do you use them? You know what I mean? I've, I use crankbaits cause they're fun. Um, yeah. You know, and I experiment in different things. But I, I really like uh, shallow running crankbaits. I'm not a big deep, you know, I, I'll be the first guy to tell you, I don't bass fish deep. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. I like to use, you know, like sub, you know, sub warts and stuff like that. Um, the, yeah. the, the Arashi weight baits are really good. Um, the deepest crankbaits I throw we might die four feet. Now, if you're talking walleye fishing, I love throwing crank. I mean, I, I use yeah. deep diving husky jerks for walleye, uh, deep diving tail dancers, shadow. I mean, the shadow wraps are great for walleye. Yeah. Dancers are great for walleye. So crankbaits have their place, but I think just in people's mindset up, it, for some reason in Canada with bass, it's not their, their go-to. I mean, I can go out on Lake Simcoe with, with a shad dancer and crush whitefish. Yeah. But, yeah, I've seen that show. That was amazing. Yeah, but when I'm going bass fishing, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pick up a, a an X wrap or, or something else. Not so much yeah. crankbait, a jerkbait. It's just a, it's a mentality thing, right? I mean, I've gone on Simcoe and fished um, late in the season with with, you know, uh, DT sixteens. Sure. Yeah. Um, and caught big largemouth, you know, and, and yeah. In, in 18 to 20 feet of water but and that's a serious trend that's happening now guys are catching on uh i mean this the 16s the 20s that we're selling yeah it's amazing how many more guys are actually doing that now here but i mean crankbaits they're they're fun to fish but it's just uh, you know for me um it, it's it's a slow methodical way to fish right yeah and i i got loose wires up <laughs> anything slow and methodical I start short circuiting, but it, it it is effective, and not only for bass. Like I've like I said, I've done shows where I've caught some crazy fish on crankbaits. So, yeah. Well, we have it's, some it's, uh, to have, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. And I, I've got a chance to use them a lot more, and I've been forcing myself to. And I got to be honest, I'm a convert. I uh, I will always have a crankbait on. I fish them an awful lot. Um, and uh, I really quite enjoy them, and I've been starting to pick things apart. I love them because they're they're tools. You get like a DT series where you can yeah. go from the four, six to eight, uh, you know, whatever depth. But beyond that, the amount of water you can cover really effectively with them, and and where a lot of people are of the opinion, when you're using crankbaits, you got to use fluorocarbon. I'm just the opposite. A lot of places I'm actually fishing, I'm purposely going through weeds, and so I'm using braid because I want to rip through it. And uh, man, oh man, I found some just incredible success with it, and and I'm loving it. And I, I just, it's one of those things I want to tell the world about it because it's so much fun, and it's, uh, and and it's been good. And it's frustrating for me because uh, we have so much good stuff already, and yet there's, uh, you know, I, I'm, we're three years ahead to all the stuff that's coming, and we have some really cool stuff you're gonna see. Check out July first, March or uh, um, 13 fishing. Uh, there's going to be an announcement on that, on a new bait there that's uh, I'm I'm super excited about. It. I actually just got my first one here, but I uh, can't show it yet. Thanks so. for sharing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a it's an exciting way of fishing. I'm really loving it, and so if I, I purposely forced myself to do that, what what are you doing? Like, are you how do you grow? What do you just go out and do the same thing all the time? I mean, you can't be as successful as you are with doing that so no what do you it's it you know i've had i've learned to, have, to become more versatile but it's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum right um you know i i've got that whole game of what lures do what and and when to use them but i've i've gone that I, i've gone down that road that um yeah, I, I think it was tony wong was talking about earlier with finesse baits right like yeah, VMC has just lit up the market with countless finesse hooks, tungsten weights, like all these little. Like if you saw what I flipped with now, versus <laughs> what I flipped with in say 1999, you would be astounded because it's it's a tiny little tungsten weight with a three odd hook and a, and a and a you know a craw on there or or using the the nico rigs it's it's incredible i'm, I'm 
power fishing heavy gear with micro baits. And yeah, it's it's just overwhelming. Every time VMC comes out with a new hook or a weight or or a new style to, to rig a plastic, yep. I go I go bonkers over it. So yeah, early adopter, it's awesome. Yeah. Hey Mike, uh, real quickly, uh, looks like I I missed the uh, the old hook here. We're being told we got one last question, and that was a couple questions ago. So uh, we've got a good one here from Derek. He's asking, uh, are you using a medium action rod with crankbaits, a moderate taper? What are you using? I I you know I, I used to be a strong believer that I could fish a crankbait on a on a stiff rod, and uh, I barely. <laughs> Self, losing fish, yeah. after fish. It, it, it's true uh you know the softer the rod the better but you want to feel so um i i can use a a, a medium heavy rod but i don't i, I want a, a fast rod not an extra fast rod or or a moderate yeah. rod even um yeah i do like to pull so a, a bit of a heavy rod works for me but almost the softer the rod the better and I'm using, I'm throwing crankbaits now on, uh, I think like a seven two concept rod that was probably made for pitching a worm, but it's yep. it's got such a, a slow action on it that it works great for cranks. Well, I think I'm the same way. I, I'll I like anything seven seven two in that that range, and I do use a, a moderate. I, I don't go to medium heavy. I, I, whenever I want, if I'm fishing specifically through cover like weeds, I'm not adjusting the rod, I'm adjusting the line. So I go to that braid and I can pop it off, no problem. And then I find I don't pull hooks on them. Uh, and then whenever I'm fishing more open water, I, I switch to that fluorocarbon, get the baits down where I want them and, and uh, you know, again, use that moderate. So that's that's where I'm at. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to add something. I know we're getting the hook here, but um, you, you have some experience with Lund. A lot of people with Lunds, um, I get asked at gas stations, you know, why the big motor? You've run Lunds, you've run an 1875 with a 150 on it. Um, yeah. And I find it, it, it's, if it's going to be a closing comment, I just want to say to people, you know, don't think, you know, if you're, if you see guys in glass boats with 200s, 250s, 300s on them, they're maxing them out because that big boat needs that to perform. If you buy a yeah. Lund, you don't have to max out the horsepower. You know, if you haven't got the budget to max out the horsepower, you can still run an 1875. Or even a 2075 with a 150 on it, and the boat will, will perform nicely. Yeah, I ran the 1875 with a 150 uh, originally because we wanted to see how it would perform, and uh, uh, it was fantastic. I, I lost a bit of top end speed, um, but again, I'm not too worried about that. But otherwise, the performance was exactly the same. In fact, I did a whole video on it. Uh, you can you can see that online on YouTube, but. Uh, my whole shot, I mean, I'd be up in full 35 miles an hour in 3.7 seconds. It was incredible. I mean, that's yeah. with a 150. There was no issues with it at all. So you had, that was that's a great finishing line there. So, yeah, so I guess uh, a lot. We're, out of, we're out of time on this one. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd really like to thank okay. Lund for the invite tonight. Okay. And uh, I'd really like to thank everybody for the questions and interaction. And, hey, how are we doing? <laughs> August, so you've August, been feeding, August, been crawling, August right? been crawling around my chair for a good twenty minutes. <laughs> oh well, you know what, everybody, if you if you could share tonight's feed and uh, be sure to check out Lund's Facebook page, uh, we appreciate you coming and uh, you know we're living our Lund lives and uh, be able to rewatch Mike and I make fools of ourselves and, uh, uh, but be sure to tune in too for uh, new, uh, and uh, future presentations because they're doing this a lot more and it's a, it's a really cool feed. So be safe and thank you everybody.